research endeavors that we carry out at the research center. They are divided into the clinical research that happens at Children's Hospital. Many of your children were perhaps participants in some of our clinical trials. And on the other end, the blood that you donated from your child went into our bench research projects. These are projects that happen in the laboratory. And we'll be touching on many of these topics during the course of this morning. So I wanted to share with you some information from Japan. I just came back from the American Heart Association meetings in Orlando, Florida, where the Japanese uh, representatives were there. And the new attack rate for Kawasaki disease in Japan is 306 cases per 100,000 children, less than five. There are more than 14,000 new cases in Japan each year. And one in every 75 children in Japan will develop this disease during the first 10 years of their life. And this is the new graph, uh, hasn't been published yet, was just shown at the American Heart Association meeting. And I think you can appreciate that the three big spikes, these are numbers of KD patients, there were three big spikes of epidemics in 1979, 1982, and 1986. And since that time, there's been this rising baseline that you can see here. And this disease is not going away. What this suggests to us is that there's increasing exposure to whatever it is that triggers Kawasaki disease. And this exposure is increasing in Japan because this is a country where the disease is well known. This is not an artifact of increased uh, case ascertainment where pediatricians are just becoming better educated, no. This is really increased numbers of patients. And the only way that can happen is if there's increasing exposure to whatever it is that triggers this disease. And we are collaborating with the Japanese, beginning collaborations with the Chinese to get to the bottom of this and figure this out. I wish I could tell you the numbers of patients that we have every year in the United States, but because there is no active surveillance program here, I show the same slide every year, and I keep hoping that I'm going to be able to put something else in that question mark box. But it's still the case that we really don't have a handle on numbers overall for the U.S. However, here in San Diego County, we do active surveillance. There are only three hospitals that care for Kawasaki disease patients. That's Rady Children's Hospital, where more than 90% of the patients go. There's the Kaiser Hospital and Balboa. So those are closed systems just for the people who are insured within um, that context. And so we are really the main facility that cares for these patients. So I can tell you that the attack rate now in San Diego is about 48 cases per 100,000 children less than five. Last year we saw about 100 new cases, and this translates with the current demographics of our community into one in every 2,000 children developing Kawasaki disease during the first 10 years of their life. So obviously a much reduced rate compared to Japan. These are our numbers. You can see that in 2014, we cared for 90 new Kawasaki disease patients in Rady Children's Hospital. And if we break it down based on the ethnic background, so uh, different uh, racial groups, different ethnicities, you can see that our Asian population in green has the highest rate, the highest attack rate. Having said that, the largest number of patients that we will take care of every year are actually Latino because we have a very, very large pool of Latino children under five. So this is an equal opportunity disease. It affects all ethnic and racial groups. But our Asian, children of Asian descent in our community are disproportionately affected. I thought I'd share with you some numbers that we gathered from hospitals around Southern California so you could get a sense of, of where Rady Children's Hospital is. So I'll just translate these as we go down. It's Children's Hospital of, uh, the Children's Hospital in Santa Barbara, uh, Children's Hospital uh, at Long Beach, that's Miller Children's Hospital, then Rady Children's Hospital, UCLA, Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, and Children's Hospital of Orange County. So these are the major children's hospitals that care for uh, these patients. And if you just look across the numbers, 
you can see that Rady Children's Hospital uh, far uh, outshadows the, the other centers. Um, a little bit of that is because we have a monopoly of healthcare here in San Diego where we serve a population of about 3.2 million and we are the only children's hospital. Um, nonetheless, there is a suggestion from the data that we've looked at across all of the West Coast that Southern California is a kind of hot spot for this disease. And of course, our work with the climate uh, folks uh, and oceanographers and climate scientists is trying to understand why that is. And I'll be speaking about that after the break. So you are all Kawasaki disease experts in this audience. You know more about it, unfortunately, than uh, perhaps the majority of pediatricians having dealt with all of these signs and symptoms firsthand. And you know that without treatment, which fortunately is not the situation for the majority of the families here today, but without treatment, one in four children will develop really serious heart problems. And these are uh, numbers from our hospital before we started using the different adjunctive therapies. Some of you may have participated in the infliximab or the Remicaid study. And we have two new treatment protocols ongoing now that Dr. Tremelay is going to talk to you about after the break, we're very, very excited. We'd like to take that 7% number in red for our aneurysm patients. These are children who are treated in a timely fashion, and we'd like to reduce that number down to zero. When children do develop the complications of Kawasaki disease, this is a reconstructed image from a CT uh, angiogram where we've injected dye through an IV and filled the blood vessels, and the arrows point to the huge bulges in the coronary arteries that are very abnormal. And Dr. Gordon is going to be talking with us this morning about how we keep these patients safe when they grow up as adults. Uh, there are potential complications, but they can be dealt with, they can be managed. And our goal is to keep all of our patients safe and living the life that they want to live. We often get questions about how we follow patients here at Brady Children's Hospital versus what the national recommendations are. There is a committee that is writing new <coughs> guidelines for Kawasaki disease on behalf of the American Heart Association. We are sadly still in the process of writing those guidelines. I hope they will be out in 2016. And these are guidelines that the whole world looks at. So, the American Heart Association is really a leader in establishing guidelines for care. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you here is a, a little bit uh, along the lines of the guidelines, but I'll point out where we do things a little bit differently here in San Diego. So first of all, the diagnosis should be made as early as possible, as quickly as possible, and uh, the IVIG and aspirin therapy should be initiated as soon as one can be confident of the diagnosis. All of your children had an echocardiogram, the ultrasound test that looked at the heart and measured the coronary arteries while they were in the hospital. And when they were discharged, it was after they had remained without fever for 24 hours, and then a first clinic follow-up was scheduled within 10 to 14 days after discharge. And we believe that this is the standard that should be adhered to by all centers in the United States. If the echo was normal and blood tests showed resolving inflammation, then likely we discontinue the aspirin in your child and follow up at one year. Uh, the current recommendations of the American Heart Association are to have another visit at six weeks. We just completed a study in collaboration with Boston Children's Hospital where we've determined that if everything's normal, that six-week echo doesn't add anything. So at the two-week visit, we'll actually be able to tell you with extreme confidence that your child has not suffered any coronary artery damage and that there's a perfectly rosy future ahead of you. And again, Drs. Uh, Daniels and Gordon from our adult team are going to talk with you more about that. We do an echocardiogram at one year, and this is optional in the uh, American Heart Association guidelines. And in the national guidelines, it is uh, uh, going to be put forward that no further echocardiography is necessary after that. However, we somewhat disagree with those national guidelines. And for our population, we feel that we're still learning about this disease. And we will invite you to come back for a reassessment for an echocardiogram every five years. 
Now, insurance companies are beginning to push back on this. We do not have evidence-based medicine that this is important to do or necessary. And insurance companies are looking at that. And we have already had many uh, uh, requests for the five-year echocardiogram denied. So this is going to change our practice uh, because uh, an echocardiogram is over $3,000 and we don't expect for families to be paying for this out of their pocket. Um, and it's not clear that, that uh, this is absolutely necessary. We feel that we're still learning about the disease and that's why we offer that to you. If the echo is abnormal at any point along the course of your child's illness, then the follow-up is tailored to the individual patient. And it's very different for every child. At age 15 to 18, we like to do what we call the exit visit. And this is where we make the decision about whether or not your child needs to be transitioned to the care of our adult KD teens. So we are incredibly privileged and lucky to live in a community where we have a group of adult cardiologists who are not only interested in Kawasaki disease, but extremely knowledgeable about the care and management of these, these teenagers as they grow up into adulthood. And they're going, the adult KD team, Dr. Daniels and Dr. Gordon are gonna be talking to you um, about their studies and, and their plans for follow-up. So at that exit visit, we do an echocardiogram, we do um, an electrocardiogram, we uh, go ahead and uh, check blood pressure and a fasting lipid panel, and we recommend for parents to do a CT calcium score, and you're gonna be hearing about what that is and why we recommend that uh, in just a minute. So I'm gonna move on now so that our adult team can take over and talk to you. I think you all know about our website where we have information. If any of you in the audience speak a language that isn't represented on this list of, of parent uh, translated uh, uh, guidelines that we have here, uh, we would uh, welcome you to translate the uh, English version into your language, send it to us, and we'll certainly post it on the website. So thank you very much for being here. I'm gonna turn it over now to the adult team. My name is Lori Daniels. I'm one of the adult cardiologists at UCSD at the cardiovascular center there. I run the, intensive, the cardiac intensive care unit there, but I'm a general cardiologist, and I've been doing research with Dr. Burns and the KD team for probably about eight years or so, I think. I'm not sure why. Um, I've spoken at this meeting each year, and each year we have a little bit more data. Uh, I'm gonna go over a lot of similar things to what we've talked about, what kind, what kind of updates some of the studies we've been doing, and give you an overview of what we're doing from a study point of view on the adult side. And after I'm done speaking, Dr. Gordon will talk more about how we treat patients from the adult side, um, how we take care of everyone and keep, keep you safe. So don't worry, if you have kids here, they're safe in the babysitting room. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, so the overall goal of the adult aspect of the KD study is to learn more about what the future holds for individuals with a history of Kawasaki disease. How will having had KD affect the future cardiovascular health and other aspects of health? And what's the risk, if there is any, for those folks who had normal echocardiograms during the acute illness? I'm mean, gonna, you know, we've already, Dr. Burns already alluded to the fact that if the echoes are always normal, that's a good thing and we think that the risk is minimal or maybe even zero. But what about folks who did not always have normal echocardiograms? We'll talk about that. And can we predict who might be at risk for future problems using some simple, non-invasive tests? And some of you had your kids or young adults in this study, and I thank you for that, and I'll show you a little bit of the data about what they did and, and what we found so far. So the study, when, uh, for the first four years, was had a lot of components to it. Um, we had we have a questionnaire that's still ongoing to learn all about medical history and symptoms and all of that. Um, we got electrocardiograms. We took extensive uh, echocardiograms, as you guys know, blood tests. Uh, many got coronary artery calcium scores. We did some special tests of blood vessel function, which I'll show you more detail on. And we also did some measurements of the carotid arteries and the peripheral arteries. Uh, 
I'll give you a little bit of detail on that. For individuals with symptoms or other indications, they got stress tests with ultrasound imaging. Also with individuals with aneurysms or other problems, some got cardiac MRIs. And for everyone who entered the study, we're still following them up longitudinally. So every couple of years, another questionnaire to find out what's an update in your health status, how are things going. So we categorized all study participants into three groups, cohort one, cohort two, and our control group. Cohort one are folks who were diagnosed here at Radio Children's by Dr. Burns and colleagues, and who's been following me since day one of Kawasaki. We know full well the medical history because it happened here. Those, that's an important cohort for us to have in the study, and we thank you for those of you who did that because that helps us learn about the true incidence and, and prevalence of disease. It's folks that we've been following from the get-go, so it's all comers, and we can get a good estimate of what percentage of people go on to have various problems or good things. Cohort two are individuals who found us. They were referred to us. They heard about our study from all over the country, actually, and maybe because they have bad problems from their KB, and so they're interested, and they Googled us, and our study popped up, so they joined us. That's important, too. It tends to be a little bit of a sicker population in general, because the ones who are online Googling us aren't the healthy ones who aren't thinking about it, right? So that's, so cohort two is important for learning about all of the sorts of things that can happen, but it's not as good for learning about the natural history of KD. And then control groups are important in any scientific study. So these are folks who did not have KD, but are often like a best friend of someone who did, so that they're a similar age and demographic, so that we can compare any findings that we may have in our KD patients to another group and say objectively, okay, is there a difference? So each of these three groups, for different reasons, is of critical importance to the study. And this is just an example. So far, we have over 300 individuals enrolled, and that number is growing. I'm going to go over not all of the components of the study, but just a couple of them that had some interesting findings that we're still working on and are still evolving. But a subset of the study group had carotid artery measurements with ultrasound. So what this shows is that someone has an ultrasound probe here. And we're measuring the thickness of the wall of the carotid artery. That's the artery in your neck that carries blood to your brain. And we know that in individuals who have atherosclerosis, so in other words, your typical uh, you know, risk factors that lead to heart attack and stroke, in those folks, thickening of the carotid artery um, it is a sign of atherosclerosis. But I want to make it clear from the get-go here that when we talk about KD, we are not talking about typical atherosclerosis. Individuals with KD, we've never seen any studies to show that they're at higher risk for atherosclerosis, but they do have inflammation of the blood vessels. And so we want to look at other vascular beds, other blood vessel beds besides the heart, so the neck, peripheral arteries, and see if we're seeing changes there. And so, so that's what this is a picture of. And we measure, we measure the thickness, the wall thickness here in pink. And, and that's what we're looking at. And overall, you know, it, it seems like good news. Um, here's our control patients, individuals with KD who have normal arteries. These are not statistically different. If anything, it's a little bit lower, but again, that's not statistically different. And again, lower is better. I mean, the nice thin wall of the carotid artery. Folks with aneurysms, again, not statistically significant, but, but slightly higher, and that's consistent with other studies. When you combine this study with studies done at other centers, these findings are consistent. Overall, folks who have had bad, bad enough Kawasaki disease that they've got inflammation in their coronary arteries and aneurysms may be a little bit more likely to have thickening of the carotid arteries. But we're not seeing that in individuals with KD who don't have echo abnormalities. And then the question mark is this transiently dilated group. Here, if anything, they, they look quite similar to the controls in the normal group, so that's a pattern that you'll see. We also have collaborated with some folks up in Canada who are KD experts as well and can do some special um, calculations on our carotid artery data and measure the strain in the carotid artery. 
Now, to me, strain sounds like a bad word, but in the setting of arteries, strain is a good thing. Strain is kind of how pliable the artery is, as opposed to being stiff. So strain is a good thing. And what you can see is that individuals who have aneurysms have a little bit of a less healthy strain pattern. Um, but if you've always had a normal echocardiogram, then the strain is similar to controls. And here we see a signal that these folks with transient dilation of their coronary arteries actually appear to have a healthier carotid strain profile. Now you'll notice that the numbers here are quite small. The numbers here were only five. We didn't have that many individuals yet with transient dilation. So and this could just be a spurious finding. And one thing that we have applied to the American Heart Association for this past summer is some grant funding so that we can enroll a whole host of more individuals in this category and find out if this is a real finding. We expect to hear from the AHA this coming week on whether we got that or not so that we can continue the study. So stay tuned. So prior dilated coronary arteries have a healthier screen pattern. We don't know if that's true or spurious, but it, the preliminary data looks interesting in that regard. A second test that we've, we've done is a measure of blood vessel health something called the endothelial cell. So this isn't a biology class, obviously, but what are endothelial cells? They're the cells that line all of our blood vessels, okay? And, and they help control the health of the blood vessel. They help make them clump when you need them, and they help constrict them at other times. So we can test the endothelial cell function by, by putting a little probe on the tip of your finger and measuring blood flow in the finger after we do a few things to you. What we do is we put a blood pressure cuff on the arm. This guy's left arm has a blood pressure cuff, and we inflate it for five minutes. So it gets a little tingly. It's a little bit uncomfortable. It doesn't, I've had it done to me a bunch of times. It doesn't hurt, but it's, you know, it feels a little funny. And then we release the blood pressure cuff, and the blood just rushes back into the arm. And you can tell how healthy those endothelial cells are by seeing how much of a rush of blood you get. So let me show you what I mean. Here's the test arm. This is the measurement of blood flow at the fingertip. It's nice and good. And then you pump up the blood pressure cuff. So now there's no blood flow to the arm. And look what happens after five minutes when you release the cuff. Boom. That extra, there's actually a bigger flow compared to here. That's called flow-mediated dilation. That excess of flow is a healthy thing. This is the control arm where there's no blood pressure cuff and it just stays the same the whole time. So that would be a nice, healthy response. Again, here's the healthy response. And here would be an abnormal response where you have the blood flow, you occlude it for five minutes, you release it, and it, blood comes back, but not better than before, just the same. So that's what we're assessing when we say we're checking your endothelial cell function. It sounds fancy, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. What did we find? Well, the pattern was very similar to what we found in the carotid arteries, in the neck arteries. We found that people with a normal echo all the time, KD patients with a normal echo, were very similar to controls, but individuals with this transient dilation actually had a healthier, more robust response of their endothelial cells to this phenomenon. So again, another signal that maybe something's going on. You see our numbers are a little bit bigger here. We had 16 we were able to do this on. Still not the numbers we would need to say with confidence that this is a real finding. But it's suggestive that maybe that's a good thing. They had transient dilation. So one, one theory, what do, what do we think maybe is going on here? One theory is that individuals who had this transient dilation with KD. You have KD, the arteries dilate a bit, but then come back to normal. Maybe the reason that they come back to normal is because they have healthier blood cells. We don't know, this is a hypothesis, right? That's why we're applying for grant funding to test this, and hopefully we'll be able to. And this is the same data, but it just shows it over time. So time after you release the blood pressure cuff, and this is the blood flow as you release it. And in yellow are those folks with transient, transient dilation, and you can see their blood flow returns quicker and more robust, as opposed to those of aneurysms, which are in red, which are a little bit worse, but probably not statistically different from controls or people uh, with, with normal coronary arteries uh, after KD here in Greece. Okay? Finally, we can measure arterial stiffness in the periphery, in the peripheral vessels. Um, arteries do get stiffer as we age. That's a normal aging phenomenon. But what we look at, and this is a little bit technical, but when you feel someone's pulse, if you had really fine fingertips, 
none of us do, but if you really did, you would be able to notice that there's actually two peaks to every wave of blood. And there's the initial peak from the heart pumping, and then there's this reflective peak as the, as the blood hits the walls and rebounds. And that's normal, but as we get older, what happens is that second peak moves closer and higher. So we can measure that, it's kind of a technical thing, but the bottom line is that we're seeing, a, a, again, a similar pattern. The arteries are less stiff in those with transient dilation, uh, a little bit stiffer in those with, uh, his, with aneurysms, and then people who've always had a normal echo after KD look very similar to controls. Again, a healthy profile there. So a lot of different ways that we're seeing a similar pattern, um, and we need to follow up on this, and we plan to do that. So those are some of the studies that we're giving, um, to, giving our adult KD study participants. The questionnaire is of critical importance as well, because that's how we can answer questions about other health problems that may or may not occur. Only by getting questionnaires sent out, and we have an online form for it now, um, we can find out what health problems or good health qualities um, individuals after TV are having. We're, we're in the process of doing a two-year follow-up, so for those of you who've entered the study, you may be hearing from us. Um, expect a phone call or email. Like I said, we have online uh, links for it now. So what are the key recommendations that I can give you from our study data so far and from other things that we know? I think that if your echocardiogram was always normal, as Dr. Burns said, that's why you're released from care. We have found no long-term abnormalities in KD adults whose echocardiogram was always normal. We do not believe that further follow-up is needed, okay? Now, if a patient with KD had aneurysms, we do recommend follow-up, preferably with an adult cardiologist who's knowledgeable about KD and knows how to treat it, and Dr. Gordon is gonna go into some details of that. What if you had transient dilation? So this data is promising. It may show that your risk is lower, but it's way too premature to say that. So it's unclear. We still recommend follow-up because that's technically not a normal echocardiogram until we have better long-term data and can say for sure whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, uh, we think follow-up is important. Now we do get a lot of questions about people who don't know their coronary artery status, and what about them? Dr. Gordon's gonna talk about CT calcium scoring. We think this is a really good way, if you're more than 10 years out from when you first had your Kawasaki disease, to find out how your coronary artery status is. Um, and then you can follow up on that with an adult cardiologist and they can kind of fill you in on which way to go. Now, I want to emphasize that KD vascular disease is not the same as typical atherosclerosis. All of us, because we're human, and because we live in America, are at risk for getting your run-of-the-mill heart attack atherosclerosis, of course. But again, we, that's not because of Kawasaki disease. They're not related. They're different phenomena. Nonetheless, we don't want to add atherosclerosis on top of KD vasculopathy that you may or may not have. So we still recommend a heart-healthy lifestyle. Um, we want to avoid having one on top of the other. So in the meantime, everyone should eat a heart-healthy diet, not like what my patient has been eating and sent me and almost caused me to pass out. That's, that's a breakfast, I don't know what. Um, exercise, right, everyone should exercise, and not like the cardiologist here at the annual American College of Cardiology meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and is, you know, make sure your blood pressure is under control, Cholesterol, don't smoke, obviously, good stress management, not because of KD, but because, you know, that's his healthy heart lifestyle anyways. Um, so, in summary, I think, you know, anyone with a, a normal echo all the time, we found no adverse problems, but persistence of coronary artery aneurysms is associated with abnormal results in all of these adjunctive studies I've been telling you about. Advanced imaging, which Dr. Gordon's going to talk about, can help clarify status if someone doesn't know their coronary artery status. Okay? So any coronary artery abnormality follow-up, we think, for life by an adult cardiologist knowledgeable about KD. But if you've had a normal echocardiogram, you probably don't need long-term follow-up. If you're interested in joining the study, we're still enrolling for the questionnaire. If the grant comes through, we're going to start enrolling for more than just a questionnaire. We're going to start up our, en our endothelial cell function tests and our carotid tests again. And we would need both KD patients for that. 
as well as healthy control, so stay tuned. If you're interested, email us and we'll be happy to uh, send you the links and, and add you to the study. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you to all the KD patients and families who joined the study, all my colleagues and all of our, our grant funders. So, um, how many of you are parents of young children with Kawasaki disease? Okay. So, just about everybody. Um, how many of you are adults with Kawasaki, who had Kawasaki disease in childhood? Okay. So, um, I'm an adult cardiologist, and um, I uh, take care of. Uh, I'm an interventional cardiologist, and so my interaction at least initially, the Kawasaki disease was taken care of uh, a small number of people who had heart attacks. Um, and my job is to prevent heart attack and stroke. That's what adult cardiologists do. Um, what I'd like to do for, for this group is, um, is share a little bit about what we don't want to happen and how we prevent that. We have, we have good tools to prevent problems. So, um, this is a picture of um, young Dr. Kawasaki <coughs> in Tokyo, um, and this is about 1960 or so. Um, and I'd like to show this because he, this is a unique, this is probably the sweetest man I've ever met. Um, but he saw something in Japan that nobody had ever seen before. Um, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of pediatricians still don't see it. <laughs> the diagnosis is missed, the kids grow up, and they have heart attacks that we don't anticipate. Um, and I'm going to show you one of them. So, um, and this was a, at the time I met him, 32 year old Laotian man um, who presented in uh, his, a primary care doctor's office with chest pain. He was 32. An electrocardiogram was done. He had um, changes that were consistent with a heart attack. So he was sent to our emergency room. And um, he was taken to the cath lab. And this is uh, the first uh, part of the angiogram. And what it, what it shows you, and I, I think most of you probably do know what aneurysms are, but I don't know where my point is. But you can see in the early part of these arteries, there's, there's dilation. So this is this is the dilate, this is the aneurysm, this is an artery that's normal in size. And this is the hallmark of Kawasaki disease. The early part of the arteries are dilated. Okay. This wasn't his problem. The problem was in the right coronary. So this is the artery that goes to the underside of the heart. And this is gigantic. This part here. And it's totally filled with blood clot. And he had he didn't know that he had heart disease. Um, he was he was a perfectly healthy, normal person, um, and now he has an occluded artery, chest pain, and unfortunately, you can die from this. Um, what we do to fix this is put uh, a wire across the blockage, put a balloon down. Um, sometimes we put stents in, uh, but you can see um, after putting this wire in, I now have flow in this artery. He's getting better. We have a number of different medicines that we use to dissolve blood clots, prevent blood clots. And so a couple of months later, I brought him back, and this is what the artery was supposed to look like, or looked like before it was filled with the blood clot. So our job uh, is one, to recognize Kawasaki disease, two, to prevent a stenosis that causes symptoms when people um, exercise, and three is to prevent thrombosis or blood clots in the Here's, this is just an angiogram showing that, that the intervention actually was successful and is actually working quite well. And I still follow him. I see him. He's, this, this patient I met about, I think it was about eight years ago. So um, how, how, do we, how do we prevent this kind of thing from happening? So he, did, he was born in Laos. He, he um, did not have uh, sophisticated medical care. He was very sick. But they, didn't, they may not have even ever heard of Kawasaki disease. Um, in, in the United States, the problem isn't that we haven't heard of it, it's just we don't think of it. And so it's not recognized, um, except in Brady Children's Hospital, if you come there. And I, and I think, you know, the slide that Dr. Burns showed, where 
UCLA, six patients. You know, what's, what? I think if Dr. Barnes moved to UCLA, all of a sudden, the numbers might go up. Um, I, I, I don't, so I think we have, a, you know, so I, I, when I speak at, the, at these KD meetings, it's all pediatricians, and so I fault them for not doing their job. I mean, I have to, you know, we have to bail people out when they miss um, Kawasaki disease and don't treat them, because the treatments work. The treatments prevent this kind of problem. Okay, so let's say you had Kawasaki disease, and all of you have a child, um, and the child had dilation of the artery, um, or, or had, and I think if they had aneurysms, you know, we know that they have potential for problems, and they need, ultimately, to have an adult cardiologist care for them. But um, when they are a young adult, do they have a problem? That's really the question. Do they need more than just an aspirin or... Do they need follow-up? So one way to screen for that is to do what's called um, a CT calcium score of the coronary arteries. And here's somebody getting a CT scan of his coronaries. This takes about five minutes. It, the radiation um, is trivial. Um, the expense, very small. Um, and so this, this is, a, is a very simple test. And if you're 25 years old or 32 years old, you shouldn't have any calcium in your arteries. Um, Dr. Burns was, was seeing a patient in clinic, and uh, he was accompanied by his uncle. <laughs> and the uncle says, you know, I had Kawasaki disease when I was a kid, and they said I was fine. Uh, I think I'll be, I'll, I'll be in the study that Dr. Daniels describes of this adult collaborative study. And so we did a CT calcium score. And what you can see, this bright white, is calcium in coronary arteries that, that would not be present in a normal artery. So um, we went, uh-oh, let's, let's look farther. And what he had was a moderate size aneurysm. This is about seven millimeters, not normal. Blood clots can form in there. Um, the inflow outflow of this aneurysm can narrow and cause problems. So it, this, this study changed our therapy for him. We put him on, on warfarin, and, and he hasn't had a heart attack. And uh, he might otherwise have been somebody who showed up in an emergency room with a blocked artery. This is um, a slide from uh, our, our uh, adult collaborative study, which shows uh, what we find when we, we do CTs or CT calcium scores on, uh, on young adults. And what we see is that after, at about 10 years, we start to see a signal. So all of these blue boxes are positive um, coronary calcium, okay? And it turns out, so aneurysm. So we were able to select out, or this, this test tells us who, who is at risk, who is in danger, who needs to have um, special medicines, perhaps, okay? How do we follow these kids? Or how do we follow our young adults? Um, Dr. Daniels has alluded to the fact that if you, get, really, if there's no abnormality, which is the case with about 70% of untreated patients with Kawasaki disease, we really don't have any reason to think there's a problem. It's like a bad problem. And um, they don't need doctors, they don't need a lot of tests. Um, that group, and hopefully that's your children, will be fine. What if, if there was transient dilatation on the echo, um, I, I, th we don't, I think it's a different story. And we have, at least anecdotally, um, several patients who had transient dilatation, the echo normalized, the pediatrician said, you must be fine, and, um, and then I meet them later in life. And um, so it's, we don't really know. And, uh, and certainly we don't agree with the, the American Heart Association guidelines that say one echo and then See you later. So if there is evidence for injury in childhood, um, it's, there is some follow-up, not annually perhaps, but, but uh, long-term follow-up and, and a CT um, calcium score at age 25 or age 30 is a very reasonable thing to consider. So this is a slide that summarizes what we would do uh, if there were uh, small aneurysms, uh, the CT calcium score, stress echoes, 
um, electrocardiograms. But a stress, a stress echo or a stress test basically will tell us if there's evidence for a blockage in the artery uh, that needs to be addressed. And um, a patient might also just have symptoms that lead us to, to ordering this test, such as chest pain with exertion. This is what a stress test looks like. Um, these are really incredibly healthy people. I don't know why they're on treadmills, but, um, but you can you can see the wires, and you, this is um, this is what a, uh, an ultrasound looks like. And when we when you exercise, your heart should contract um, symmetrically and normally. So if it if it contracts normally while at rest, you exercise, and one of the walls of the heart doesn't work well, that means there's a blockage. That means we have a problem that we need to deal. This is another kind of stress test. This is a nuclear medicine stress test. This, is, this involves uh, radiation. And so, particularly for young people, um, I don't think this is the ideal test because why would, you know, why would you expose young people over and over again to um, a high radiation exposure? And this is quite high radiation, actually. So, um, follow-up for patients with giant aneurysms. This is, fortunately, a small slice of the KD population, but these are the ones who are at the highest risk. Um, every one of these patients needs an adult cardiologist. Uh, once again, I've summarized the tests that we would do, stress echoes, EKGs, and so forth. Um, for giant aneurysms, we treat them with anticoagulants. Warfarin has been the traditional anticoagulant. Um, I, I think that once we have some experience with, there are new drugs that you don't have to get blood tests for, I think are likely to work as well or better, but the studies need to be done. Last year when I gave this talk, somebody asked, well, when do you do bypass surgery? So I put, in, I put these slides in for, for whoever asked that question. Um, basically, we do bypass for people who have um, you know, severe symptoms and a severe obstructive coronary disease. Um, and these are things that sometimes we can treat them with stenting, rotational arthrectomy, and other techniques. Um, but this is, a, this is, I'm going to show you a patient who uh, I think was perfect for bypass. This is uh, a ventricular gram. We're taking a picture of how well the heart pumps. But one of the things you can notice <laughs> is that um, there's a calcified artery right up here. This is, so that's her left anterior descending artery. She'd been on Coumadin um, since age two. Um, this is, this is a, a selective angiogram of the artery, and there's her aneurysm. Um, and so the problem is you can get a blockage before or after, um, and you can get a blood clot in this. So that's a heart attack. Um, and, and fortunately, she has not had that. Her heart works fine. Um, but she, this is an active person who um, is tired of getting blood tests, and... Um, and uh, so what should we do with this? Um, and should we do an intervention of any kind? Well, it turns out we have a test that helps us to predict who will do better with an intervention. And it's called fractional flow reserve. And we uh, basically measure pressures um, beyond uh, the stenosis and proximal to it. And if we get certain numbers, less than 0.8 um, as a group, that group will do better. If we, bypass or uh, perform a percutaneous intervention and open up the blockage. So that's what we did for her. And she's living happily ever after, at least so far. Um, so my, my part of this, this presentation, particularly for those of you with young children, is, is really just to make the point that, that if you stick with your doctors and you have good ones, the future is bright. And we, because we really have good tools, we have good ways of recognizing whether there's a problem we have good medicines. Um, this is uh, an ongoing process. We have more to learn. We, there, we, all of this is going to be done better with time. Um, in San Diego, we have really the largest experience with adult, uh, adults with Kawasaki disease, certainly in North America. Um, and um, so if you're in San Diego, this is a good place to be. Future is bright. Thanks for your attention. We'll answer questions in a bit.
share with you today is most of you participated in an extra study where you donated blood from your child for research purposes. So you understood, I hope, at the time that you signed that consent form, that these blood studies were not going to directly benefit your child, but that you were trying to help make the world a better place. And so we thank you for that. And I wanted to share with you a little bit about what we did with those blood samples. Um, I also want you to know that the consent forms that you signed were reviewed by a very important panel called the Institutional Review Board that exists here at UCSD, and it exists at every center that does research, and it's the purpose of this committee to review the research and to approve it that it's something that's safe and reasonable to be offered to parents for their children to participate. Now, I happen to be the chair of that committee here at UCSD, but I assure you that I was uh, recused from the room when the protocols were uh, uh, reviewed. So I, I did not participate in the review of our own protocols. It was a committee that decided that this research was good and safe and should go forward. And you all trusted us uh, with uh, your child's blood. And here's what we did with it. So first of all, Deanna, our wonderful lab manager who's here, uh, is going to process the blood samples when they arrive at the lab. Now, our laboratory is not at Children's Hospital. It's actually in an adjacent building here at UCSD. And there's a lot of processing that goes on to put the blood into a form and the components of the blood into a form that can then be used for research. So Deanna's hard at work. She also does a wonderful job mentoring students who come to the lab to learn more about research and what's involved. Now the blood would uh, next most likely be separated into its different parts, the liquid part and the cellular part. And the liquid part, which is preserved in various ways, would go into very large freezers uh, where it's maintained at minus 80 degrees centigrade. So very, very cold and this preserves the proteins so that we can do research 20 years from now, when we, uh, in the next few years, I'm so optimistic, figure out the cause of Kawasaki disease, we can then perhaps go back to blood samples from children where maybe the diagnosis wasn't completely clear, and we can actually test those blood samples that have been frozen in perpetuity and preserved. We can test them for whether or not that child actually had Kawasaki disease. But we've created a very, very important frozen bank of samples that is now being used all over the world. Another thing that happens with your child's blood is that Alessandro Franco, who's the director of the immunology part of the research at the KD Research Center, is going to take the cells, the living cells from that blood. So we actually have to get someone to drive the blood up from Children's Hospital to the laboratory, handle them very gently and very carefully because we want those cells to be alive. And those cells are going to be worked with in a sterile hood, which you see here, the ultraviolet light is on in that hood. But someone could be sitting at that hood uh, and working with the cells in a completely sterile environment growing those cells and studying those cells. And what you see here are the cells living in little tissue culture wells, and we feed them, just like you feed your children. We feed ourselves and keep them alive and happy. And we're studying what they're doing and what uh, they may or may not be doing right or wrong. We can then stain them and subject them to what's called flow cytometry, which is basically a, an advanced apparatus with laser that counts the cells that are stained with various um, molecules that tell us about the phenotype or the nature of the cells. So your blood contains many different kinds of cells and we can identify who they are and what they're doing by staining them and then analyzing them in this fashion. This is all very expensive work and the Macklin Foundation grant is going a long way to help fund this work because it's extremely expensive not only to buy the antibodies or the, the stains that we use for these cells, but just to do this whole process of uh, culturing them in the laboratory. This would be the kind of uh, example of an experiment that we might do with those cells where uh, the patient gets their IVIG infusion and then after that, we sample the blood, for example, when you come back to your clinic visit at two weeks, that extra 
or blood sample that we take has peripheral blood mononuclear cells or PBMCs. These are the one of the cellular components of the blood, and we put them into different wells and we incubate them with, in this case, um, actually the IVIG that your child received, and we look at what those cells are doing. So that's an example of the kind of research that we might do with living cells from your child. So there are many, many different components to our research, and this research is done in collaboration with experts who have specific kinds of skills and may work in laboratories all over the world. So those blood samples are actually getting on airplanes and flying all over. You might like to join them, it's a lot of fun. They're going to many different countries around the world. Um, so you don't get to go, but the blood samples get to go. And they go frozen and specially uh, delivered by DHL and FedEx um, to the various laboratories um, across the world that have special expertise. We can't have all the skills that we need in one laboratory or even one university. And so we collaborate with the best people in the world who know how to ask and answer important questions, and they need your child's blood in order to be able to do that. So uh, this is our collaborator, Michael Levine, at Imperial College uh, St. Mary's Hospital in London, and uh, just a, a, a wonderful uh, relationship that we've created with the collaborators there, and uh, a possibility through the Macklin Foundation that money that is donated, pounds, not dollars, that are donated to Dr. Levine's laboratory in London for the purpose of our collaborative research will also be matched dollar for dollar to our laboratory here in the United States. So we've got this really wonderful collaborative relationship ongoing where money raised in the UK will also benefit our laboratory here and count as part of that $2.5 million match that we talked about uh, in the challenge grant. Just a little close up here. Uh, they have a lot of wonderful history uh, in the UK and in the laboratory where Professor Levine works, uh, Alexander Fleming actually uh, discovered penicillin. So uh, it's, it's fun to go and, and visit and, and see the history there. And of course, we hope that uh, either in his laboratory or in ours, uh, we won't discover penicillin, but we'll discover the cause of Kawasaki disease. Uh, this is uh, in the garden across from the hospital, and we have uh, uh, Rolando Chimas from Italy who collaborates with us, Martin Hibbert from Singapore, uh, Mike and myself meeting over a coffee discussing Kawasaki disease research. So I, I want you to have the sense that when you donate your blood uh, to our laboratory, it's going to where it needs to go, and it's part of this huge network of investigators who are passionate about solving the mysteries of Kawasaki disease. So this is the kind of slide that we show at the end of our academic talks that show all the different collaborators who have contributed uh, to the work that we do, and we've contributed to their work uh, with your blood samples. So many different groups. Um, Dr. Tremelay is going to be talking to you about the clinical trials that are ongoing with the collaborators that you see here at those institutions. And we're, we're very, very excited uh, about that part of the future. So we want to thank you from all of us at the KD Research Center for trusting us with the blood samples from your children. Um, please know that you've made an incredible contribution to solving the mysteries of Kawasaki disease. And thank you from all of us.